let me thank all of you who have made it a point to attend these lectures, marking the 27th anniversary of our great party. And I want, on your behalf, to thank all our distinguished speakers who have done justice to the theme of the 27th anniversary. We have received advice on how to revitalize our branches. But at the same time, they've taken us on a historical journey of how this party came to be. And also on the traditions that the party must hold sacred, which incidentally, many of our young ones are not acquainted with. And so often when you hear our elders say, we must go back to our core values, then they are talking of going back to the traditions of the party that have made us the most successful party in the Fourth Republic of Ghana. We've won more elections than any other political party in the history of the Fourth Republic. We brought more development and prosperity to this country than any political party in the history of the Fourth Republic. And that's why I always say that you must feel proud to be a member of the NDC. Often, a lot is done to make, shake your faith in the NDC. But I must tell you that NDC is a proud party, NDC is a successful party, and NDC has done more for this country than any other party in the Fourth Republic. Today, I don't want to distract from what the speakers have said. And so all I want to do is to compliment what they have said. And so I won't go off on a tangent so that tomorrow the headlines will be talking about only what uh, the flag bearer said. I'll just add a few more points to what um, we have heard already. As is always said, organization determines everything. And so from, if you look at the history of progressive parties in Ghana, one of the first of which was the Convention People's Party, the CPP, Nkrumah said, organize the people. Organize, organize, and organize. Because organization determines everything. And so when we say that revitalizing the branches and going to the grassroots, we're meaning that go back to the grassroots and organize the party at the grassroots. We were the first to make our branches contaminous with polling stations before any other party in the Fourth Republic. Right from the start, 1992, when we organized the branches of the party, every polling station was a branch. It was not until the year 2000 that the MPP woke up and copied the same roadmap that we had and, al and also started their polling station executives. And so over the years, we have allowed those branches to decay. And that is because we have always been seeking a shortcut. When it comes to reorganization of the branches, often the secretary and the organizer at the constituency level will be asked to go and carry out the branch audits and to organize elections in the branches. I've been a, mem a member of parliament for 12 years. I know what used to be done. You take a pen and a paper, go to the branch, go and sit in one person's house, write the names of the executives, and then come back and say, oh, elections have been held. That is what caused the decay in our branches. But I'm happy to say, for the first time in a long time, the last branch reorganization we did, if not in all branches, in a majority of the branches, meetings were held and elections were held. For the first time, even as former president, I went back to my branch as we had all been instructed. And I sat in the branch elections with my branch members and we elected our executives at the branch level. Since then, even with the constraint of time, I have managed to attend at least one branch meeting, even though I don't live 
in, um, in, my former, in my constituency. And so the party executives are organizing for us to remember to attend branch elections. And I think this weekend or very soon, one of the branches has been selected and I'm going to join them in their branch meeting and we're going to put up their branch signboard where they will write, they will put up the branch signboard at the venue where the branch meets and they'll write the dates of the meetings and everything so that everybody knows that this is where the branch meets, this is the date of the, the next scheduled meeting and we must all try and join so that the branches can strategize. They say elections are won or lost at the polling station. If we are not vigilant and hardworking at the branch level or at the polling station level, whatever you do at the national level, you will lose the election. And that is why I think that this theme selected for today's lecture is very important. It's a targeting effective branch organization. Targeting effective branch organization because the branches will determine everything. As our speakers were talking, they spoke about several things that we could do and several things that have undermined our fortunes in the past. And all of them emphasize the issue of unity. The party is bigger than anybody. And the democratic means of selecting leaders at all levels of the party is to hold elections. In the past, we used to do it by consensus. And it was more amicable. There were few quarrels. We would meet together and say, by consensus, let's decide who should go this time. And we will all agree on one person, and we'll support the person to win. But with the advent of democracy opening up and all that, even that consensus is democratic, but it was our traditional <laughs> means of doing it. But now we have to hold elections. And so nominations are open, people fill forms to contest. And we must always remember that only one person can win. Unfortunately, when these contests are held and one person wins and another doesn't win, at the constituency level, the person will decide that he wants to go independent. If he doesn't decide to go independent, he will say, okay, he has agreed. But everybody knows that underground, he is working and undermining the candidate. And so, like he said, 106 seats in a 275-member parliament is the most abysmal result we've ever had in any parliamentary election. And this is because there was no commonality of purpose and that people who lost felt cheated somehow one way or the other and decided that they will undermine the collective. And so there are several constituencies we virtually threw away. Elijah Hood, we have started mentioning them. Constituencies we had never, ever lost since 1992. We lost for the first time. And if you added the independent candidates' results, to the result of our parliamentary candidate, we easily won the constituency. But because we divided the vote, the MPP person slipped through and took the constituency for us. We must not allow that to happen in 2020. We're going to go to parliamentary elections, uh, primaries. Somebody would emerge. And if that person emerges, let us all support that person. It's his turn today. Tomorrow, it will be your turn. You will emerge. And if you are a gracious loser and you support whoever emerges, tomorrow when you emerge, that is the way you will also be supported to go forward. But if you undermine the person, everybody will remember what you did. The next time when it's your turn, they will pay you back in the same coin. And so let us remember that. I think when Elijah Hudu spoke, he talked, and uh, Dr. Obeda Samoa, 
He talked about the regional task forces that we had. After any elections, either constituency elections or parliamentary primaries, we had the regional task forces that used to go around and find out all the areas where there were, there were disputes. And these were normally senior comrades and elder people in the party who commanded respect. And so all the disputing factions will be called. And they will adjudicate, listen to both sides, and eventually they will come out with a resolution of the dispute. I think that it's a tradition that we must maintain. I remember I myself, in 1996, when I stood for the parliamentary elections against my senior brother, uh, Honorable Gilbert Edi, and I made victorious. Several petitions were written to party headquarters, and in the tradition of the party, the, the task force came. It was headed by Alaji Mama Idrisu, if I remember. And we were all asked what happened. The executives were all there. And eventually, they made a determination in my favor. And they asked myself and Gilbert to embrace each other, to shake hands, and to bury the hatchets there. But I must say that when you have emerged from a contest like that, a lot more is required of the winner than the loser. You don't expect that the loser will come to you from time to time and ask you, what should I do? You must always stretch out a hand and invite him to come. And that is the only way that you can make peace and unite the constituency. After I won, my elder brother Gilbert would not have been happy. But yet, if there was any major thing going on in the constituency, I will send to him and say, oh, brother, I'm going to the constituency. We have this coming up. Can you come along and let's do it together? And he will graciously come. We'll do it together. And just the fact of our people seeing the two of us together started to mend the division that had occurred as a re result of the contest we had had. The executives were divided. Somebody will say, oh, this one, he campaigned against me, so I won't work with him. No. That's the more reason why you must work with the person. Indeed, our chairman of blessed memory, Alaji Mejira, he was on Gilbert's side. But after I won, any time I was going back to the constituency, I would stop somewhere near Ejisu and load my boots with Brodier and Banchi and Abe and other things that you couldn't get in the north. And my first point of call will be at his house. And I'll leave a message, tell Alaji I've come. But my mission is to his wife. And I'll go and offload uh, uh, plantain and Banchi and things to his wife. So by the time he comes home, they've pounded some fufu with palm nut soup for him. I mean, naturally the man you know, gave up all hostility towards me. And he became one of my most faithful and loyal executives until he died. And so it's a matter of human relations. And it's a matter of bringing people back together again. We must all learn it. If you want to be a leader, you must learn to be a reconciler. Let me... Let me just touch on a few things to do with attitudes. As was said, we're a social democratic party. And so our natural allies are the ordinary people, not the elite. Our natural allies are the ordinary people. And so the workers, the nurses, the teachers, you know, the civil servants, the vulnerable, they are all our natural allies. And one of the things they detest is opulence and so in our attitudes one we must be modest modest in the way you dress modest in the way you carry yourself it might be your birthday you have the money you can afford it but please be modest in how you celebrate because if you do that 
and the person is suffering and does not have money to put food on the table and he sees you through a lavish party and then tomorrow you come and talk to him and say oh I came to campaign vote for this party you think he will listen to you and so we must be modest we must be humble and even in our discourse the way we talk we must be decorous in the way we speak you don't win the argument by shouting or insulting when indeed when you shout and insult then that is when they can't tell the difference between you and the MPP because with them is their modus operandi when they start losing an argument the next thing to do is to start shouting at you and insulting you and if you don't take time they even attempt to assault you in the studio but you must always maintain your calm and just hammer home your points very effectively the best way to win the hearts and minds is to hammer home your points. And that goes to all our communicators. Never go unprepared. If you are put on panel placement, make sure you look at all the topical issues that have happened in recent times and make sure you read up on them. Normally, they will send out you know, some uh, uh, communications updates on various topics. Read them and understand the points. If you don't call your communications director or something and let him explain it to you, you must always seek to win the argument. And it's the same on the campaign trail. If you go to discuss with a group of people, go knowing the points that you will make that will put the party's interest first. And never feel peeved about any counter arguments. You must tolerate counter arguments, but hammer home your point as effectively as you can. Like I said, our natural allies are the ordinary people, but also our allies are the young people. Our party has always controlled the young people. Somehow we lost touch. And we must understand that Ghana's demographic is changing. It says that more than 60% of the population is aged below 35 years. And so, while we remember the traditions and where we've come from, unfortunately for a lot of those young people, a lot of the narration that our senior comrades were making, they do not understand and cannot conceptualize. And so they don't remember that you couldn't walk into the shop and buy anything you wanted. These are the computer generation people. And so I'll say that still use social media as effectively as you can, because that is what a lot of the young people are hooked on to. But don't get stuck on only social media. While you use social media and WhatsApp, also find time to go down to the ground and campaign and organize. There's a change in demographic. In the past, we had what we call the rural poor. And it was considered that everybody in urban centers was much more well-to-do. Unfortunately, because of rural-urban drift, Ghana's population divide has changed. Now it is estimated that we have almost 54% of our population living in urban centers. And that means that we have about 46% in rural areas. NDC had always typically drawn its support from rural constituencies. That is changing. We must go after the urban constituencies. And so we must look at that changing demographic. While we continue to work to maintain our support amongst the rural poor and rural peasants and those natural allies of us, we must also go after the new poor groups in urban centers because they also are natural allies. And so we must take note of that. Victory is within our grasp, but we cannot win by default. A lot of people say, oh, NPP has failed. It is true they failed. They've reneged on most of their promises. 
They have a scandal almost every week. Their president cannot deal with corruption. All All he can do is clear his appointees anytime they are involved in corruption. When you talk about corruption, his perception of dealing with corruption is to deal with appointees of the previous government. There is regime accountability, which you must do as president. It's your duty. If corruption cases come out under you and they are your appointees, you must have the courage to deal with them. Indeed, that is even the greater test of courage in dealing with corruption. Dealing with your political opponents is the easiest thing to do. When we come into government to deal with the previous government, NPP administration that has gone, in 2021, when we come, we can deal with them easily. It doesn't take courage to do it. It doesn't take courage to do it. Courage is when you deal with corruption in your own administration. And if I decide to read the list of corruption allegations that have been glossed over and dismissed by the president, we'll stay here till midnight. So he should clean up. He should clean up so that he doesn't leave it to NDC when we come back in 2021 to come and clean up for him. We are not the same as MPP. We have always stood by the truth. We have not told false promises just because we want political power. We tell the people exactly what we can do for them. And when we come into office, we make our best effort to deliver exactly what we said we can do for them. It was in 2016 that MPP elevated false promises to a historic level. It was just like, just say anything that people want to hear because we want political power. But you forget that when you have done that and you come into power, the reality will catch up with you. And so today, a large group of people are disappointed with the MPP. There was a survey that ask people, what, you know, motivated you to vote for MPP? He said, which party did you vote for? He says, MPP. He says, what motivated you to vote for MPP? And one of the highest responses was the promises they made were very inviting. Today, 1v1d has become 1v1 pond. Because before the election, I asked, I said, are you digging dugouts? or dams for irrigation purposes. They refuse to answer. The reality has caught up. These are dugouts. In some cases, they, are, they, can't, they don't even qualify as dugouts. And so when the people, the people had the, the, the impression that they were going to give them dams for which they could do dry season gardening and other such agricultural ventures. So when they come and see that little pond, I mean, even if the cattle drink from the pond, in the dry season, by rainy season, that water will be gone. And so people are disappointed. And so often when you hear them say, oh, all politicians are the same, I will show you that that is a disappointed MPP voter. That is a disappointed MPP voter. Why you say, oh, I even vote again. All politicians are the same. Then you know that it is a disappointed MPP voter. But I can assure them that NDC is a truthful party. We stand by the people. We do our best all the time in the interest of the people. And so all of us must work hard. It, you, you, all of us must not seek to be on the national campaign team. All of us must not seek to do work at the national level. They say agroniform. The work is at the branches. And so every appointee, ex-appointee, every ex-DC, every person who is committed to NDC, you have a branch, you have a constituency. Assist materially and physically. 
go back to the constituency as often as you can and join them in their activities. And if they are doing something and they need some help, your widows might, whatever little you can get, go to the executives and say, look, this is the little I can get. Use it and help. That is how we can be able to be victorious. And so it shouldn't be just when the flag bearer comes, then all ex-appointees and everybody runs and comes to join. Oh, I hear you're going to Central Region. I want to come. No. The work you do in your own constituency and in your own branch is more important than following the flag bearer. And so let us develop a new mindset. Let us develop a new mindset. And let us work to our executives. Let us make sure that we follow party discipline and that in all our communication, the interest of the party is paramount. If you don't have anything to say, don't say it. The party's message must go through. And so when the communicators are working hard, the executives are working hard and pushing the message, then you hear somebody goes and gives a counter, a message that, you know, rolls us back. If you won't communicate, just stay and let others do it. And don't go say anything that hurts the party's interest. And you can tell. When... And you can tell. You can tell when your message is against the interest of the party. Suddenly, you hear all the MPP communicators praising you. Oh, as for this man, he's a good man. That's because your, what you are saying sounds sweet in their ears. Let us be on message. Let us be on message. If you have any message that is counter to the party line, keep it to yourself. And so let me end here by thanking all of you once again and to say that we appreciate your support. We know that NDC, we're going to work hard. We're going to be vigilant. Vigilance is important. We don't seek to cheat any political party. We want the election to be transparent, free, and fair. And that is why we are doing what we're doing and talking to the Electoral Commission. We don't have any grudge against the Electoral Commissioners. We have no grudge against them. Election disputes are one of the major generators of conflict. And so we want that an election is conducted on a certain standard that when it is conducted, all parties to the election can accept that this election was free and fair. And so if they win or they lose, they are able to accept whatever the results come out. But if you are not transparent, if you don't involve the political parties, the political parties are the key stakeholders of our democracy. Our constitution is based on multi-party democracy. Multi-party democracy. If it was a one-party state, what do we need an electoral commission for? But it's multi-party, and so there are different stakeholders. And that is the reason for IPAC. IPAC is not established by law, but it's convention that any step the Electoral Commission is going to take, it, cons it, cons it consults the stakeholders so that they understand what the Electoral Commission is going to do. And when they understand it, they accept it and can support the Electoral Commission to do it. And so the Electoral Commission shouldn't see us NDC as a danger to Ghana's democracy, as a commissioner said. How can we be a danger to Ghana's democracy? We've participated in elections seven times. We have never disputed elections. When we have lost, we have accepted. There are the other people who never accept. When they lost the first one, stolen verdict. Second one, board verdict. They've never lost an election in this country. 2012, they took us to court for one whole year.
NDC has never done that. So if you are talking of enemies of Ghana's democracy, who is the enemy of Ghana's democracy? We have been more cooperative with the Electoral Commission than any other party in the Fourth Republic of Ghana. And so the Electoral Commission should see us as partners. When successful elections are held, it's the commissioners who take the credit. They get invited all over Africa to go and train other electoral commissioners. They get invited to go and observe elections in other countries. And so we're helping you to be able to discharge your duties properly so that you gain international recognition and national recognition. The Electoral Commission is a partner to us to be able to attain our objectives of winning elections. And so I'd like to tell the commissioners, we are your partners. We are ready to engage. Happily, I can see maybe some rapprochement is developing. I received a letter from the EC chair asking to meet me and uh, have a discussion. And so at that discussion, we will put all our concerns on the table. And I hope that they will listen to those concerns so that all of us have a, con a, a confidence in the integrity of the elections going forward. The last two things. One, I know you guys are working already on the limited registration exercise. Please put all your effort in it to make uh, sure that as many of our supporters who have not registered are able to go and register. And then two, the Ghana card registration exercise is on. All of us who can register should make sure that we go and, and register. It is another identification for anything that you want to do. And so it is not going to be the sole identification for registration as a voter. It will add up to the number of things you can use to identify that you are a Ghanaian. Before we could use the NHIS card, but our opponents went to court and had NHIS card excluded. And so if you can get the Ghana card, you have a birth certificate or you have a passport or you can get two people to vouch for you that you are a Ghanaian, you can register as a voter. And so let our people not shy away from the Ghana card registration. Anytime they come to your area to register, please go and register and collect your Ghana card. I thank you very much.